Hi, my name is Brother Ken Homan. I'm a Jesuit of the Midwest province, and I'm delighted to be here with you today to discuss labor in the Catholic Church, sponsored by the Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance. I had a bagel and cream cheese for breakfast this morning. The wheat was grown by farmers in western Kansas. Immigrant farm workers in Wisconsin harvested and processed the dairy. The plastic from the container and the bag are even harder to track down. One of the great challenges in doing ethical purchasing is trying to figure out where things come from. And one of the challenges is that it's often intentionally hidden to see where things come from, how they're made, who they impact, and how it changes and impacts the environment around us. Today, we're here to offer you some tools and a bit of a framework to help you determine how to do ethical purchasing and how to engage in this kind of important work. So why is this work important for us as both individuals and institutions? It can be tempting to think of doing the right thing as just a one-off activity, something that we do once and then we don't have to think about anymore. But working for justice is an ongoing effort, a commitment, and we discern as Catholics how to do that in our lives on a daily basis, both as individuals and as a community. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Catholic social teaching and how we got to the place we are today. One of the very first documents that we talk about is Rerum Novarum, Of New Things. Written in 1891, the document laid out that all Catholics, institutions, businesses, workers, everybody has both rights and responsibilities when it comes to pursuing justice. A worker has a right to a fair wage, compensation, healthy working space, and a duty to do good and hard work. As we moved into a more complex economy and the Industrial Revolution deepened, in 1931, the popes released Quadragesimo Anno, the 40th anniversary letter of Rerum Novarum. And in that document, they discuss social order, that there's a particular way about the world, that for the world to function justly and adequately, we all need to be invested as a community, ensuring the rights and dignities of workers and especially the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. As this social teaching continued to emerge, more and more communities wanted their voices heard in determining and examining social situations. We started to see the emergence of liberation theology. In this theological framework, we ask, what does the reign of God look like? How do we pursue the reign of God? And how do we make sure that the reign of God happens here on earth today? People said, though, you know, some of this theology, it needs to be more concrete. It needs to be more exact to our lives and to our situations. And so we had the development of womanist and mujerista theologies. These theologies particularly asked, what's the experience of women of color, women in poverty, women as caretakers and mothers? How does that impact our understanding of labor rights and labor justice? Through all of these different theologies, one of the core and central tenets is that we are always a community. We are never merely individuals, but we are always together. We are Eucharistic. We are a communion. In recent years, we've begun to recognize that this Eucharistic and communion being together includes our environment around us. Environmental stewardship, protection, and care for creation have become core elements of Catholic social teaching and doctrine. When we consider the environment, we're also considering our neighbor. What I do upstream impacts the people who live downstream, and vice versa. And so together, all of these elements come together to impact how we think about acting justly, especially in our purchases. So let's get back to some of our earlier questions. How do we simplify these really complex questions about where our goods come from and how can we do a good job and use our faith as a tool for acting justly and making wise ethical purchases? I'd like to introduce you to the pastoral circle, a wonderful tool for doing social analysis and seeing what our faith says about how we act justly in the world. 
The first step of the pastoral circle is experience. Experience digs into the very concrete, the material. It asks, what are people feeling? What's actually going on? What's happening? And so it's the very tangible things that we see and engage in the world that tell us both what's happening justly and unjustly. So let's take a look at some concrete examples as they relate to clothing and ethical purchasing. So let's think about what happens with our clothing. When we purchase something, 32 hands have probably touched the clothing that you're wearing right now and been part of the creation, shipping, and purchasing process, that entire part. And when you do, that clothing has traveled up to 35,000 kilometers just before getting to us, perhaps even more if you're purchasing online. When you think about the clothing that you're wearing, about 98% of clothing in the U.S. comes from overseas and is purchased internationally. Perhaps even more scandalously, about 30% of the clothing that is made never actually sees the shelf or gets purchased. And so we have to ask in that experience, where does that clothing go? Who ends up with the scraps and the landfill and the environmental impacts of that clothing? We often look to countries like Bangladesh for creating our clothing, where the wages are incredibly low, the working conditions are hazardous and perilous. And then we also think about questions about gender, for example. About 80% of garment workers in Bangladesh are women. And so we ask these questions of who is being impacted by our labor practices? Who's being impacted by our environmental practices? Why is it overwhelmingly women and people of color? UNICEF estimates that more than 100 million children are affected by garment and footwear supply chains. As workers, the children of working parents, community members near farms and factories. And so we think about then, again, that experience. Weak maternity protections for mothers, absence of childcare and breastfeeding support in factories, and poor living conditions. All of these are part of the experience of when you put on a shirt, who else did it impact and how did it impact them? Now that we've had this sense of experience and we can answer some of those questions of who's being impacted, we can delve into the social analysis of what's going on. When we get into social analysis, we ask questions like, who is involved? Why are they involved? What's the social setting? What are the laws that govern the trade of clothing and the materials that go into them? What are the systems and structures in place that affect clothing manufacturing, purchasing, shipping, packaging, all of those different questions and elements. We ask who's doing what? And that's the big question of social analysis. It's important when we do social analysis not to necessarily isolate or judge too harshly. Lots of people want to do the right thing, but feel like they have to compete in a business world that makes it incredibly difficult. It's important to look at structures as a whole and how they're impacting us, not to target an individual person to ascribe guilt or evilness or sinfulness, but to say, if they want to do the right thing, can they do the right thing? And that gets us into our theological reflection. The theological reflection asks us to consider what does our faith say about this existing condition? And what does our faith say about what the condition should be? We have lots of these different theological tools for considering, whether it be scripture, Catholic social teaching, or theological reflection, we have a lot of different tools for assessing what our faith says about situations and what our faith says about what the world should look like. We take these theological inspirations and beliefs and truisms and we move into action planning, to concrete steps. When we think about action, we need to make sure that we are doing very concrete work. And so one of the great tools that you can use is called a SWOT analysis. SWAT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. 
Strengths is a question of what are we good at? What resources do we already have at hand? What power do we have? What power are we able to build? Weaknesses asks questions like, what are we not good at? What skills do we still need to build? What are the challenges that we face? Opportunities is one of the areas you want to focus on the most. Where are chances that we can grow? Where are the people that we can collaborate with? When we think about labor justice, we also think about environmental justice. And so opportunities might be saying, how can we collaborate between different organizations? And then there are the threats, those who don't want things to change, those who want things to stay the way they are and to not really move forward. And so between those things, we develop goals that need to be concrete, implementable, measurable, and engaging. And so when you think about goals, you need to be able to think about what percentage of our clothing is going to be from this better company? What environmental impact and measurable outcomes are we going to have on the river where these clothes are being made? They need to be real specific. Now throughout all of these goals, we need to think about who are our partners? Who are the other key stakeholders who want to be engaged here? When it comes to labor justice, some of the biggest partners that we have are cooperatives, labor unions, and worker centers. Each of these groups takes a different approach to how to pursue labor justice, but they're all integral and all need to be at the table when we're deciding next steps for action. Throughout all of this process are questions of discernment. Discernment is a question of how we are constantly moving forward toward Christ and toward a more just community. And so we ask discernment questions both as individuals and as community. Those individual discernment questions might be, what skills or resources do I have to offer right now? What skills do I need to acquire? How is God calling me as an individual? How can I ask for help and support to say, I'm not sure what to do. Who else might have good answers? How can I myself offer support to those who are seeking answers or an ally in this important work? We also discern as a community with very similar questions. What skills do we as a community have to offer right now to engage those around us? How is God calling us as a community and where do we need to ask for help and support? It's important through all this process to ask, how are the rights and dignity of workers being exploited? How can we help and support workers? And to ask those theological questions of, why are unions so important? How do they relate to Catholics? And how do we support union rights in a workplace and community? I really love this quote from Pope Benedict the 16th, who says, work is of fundamental importance to the fulfillment of the human being and to the development of society. Thus, it must always be organized and carried out with full respect for human dignity and must always serve the common good. So let's get to some of those key talking points that we need to address to make sure you have the tools and ability to do this important work. So let's talk about the Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance. This major question of what are ways to ensure stronger ethical standards for workers and the earth. The Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance removes guesswork from those difficult questions. SIPA believes that Catholics and Catholic institutions have a responsibility to purchase with the worker and planet in mind and ask that question, how is the dignity of work and the worker being upheld in our purchasing practices? SIPA finds that we can ensure there are stronger ethical purchasing standards for workers and the environment by partnering with clothing producers that have access that, that have these shared values and working within a regionalized supply chain here within the United States. When we do this regional work, we know precisely who is making our products, what conditions they're working in, and how we can respond to questions of injustice. The wonderful thing is that this model is easily repeatable. It is easily brought to your institution into your community. 
And so it's a great way for you to plug in and to pursue ethical purchasing. Let's talk about a few places that have really pursued this kind of work. One great example are the business students at St. Louis University who have gone on several immersion trips to the Carolina Textile District and then came back to campus to form a steering committee with goals such as developing an ethical purchasing guidebook to help the university do the right thing. They work with university departments and offices to utilize and advocate for changes in contract language and third-party vendors to make sure that when they are making purchases, especially big bulk orders, that they're doing the right thing and pursuing justice in that work. Students at the University of Dayton have also been incredibly successful, and they've worked to collaborate with the business schools, sustainability schools, and purchasing departments at the university, especially the bookstore, to create a campus culture of ethical purchasing. From forming a class centered around sustainable supply chains that include an immersion to the Carolina Textile District toward their petition at work, all of these groups have had a wonderful opportunity and done tremendous work in making sure that they have done ethical purchasing. That is, they pursued justice through the clothes that they wear, through the goods on campus, and through the community around them. It's important to remember, as Pope Benedict XVI said, that purchasing is always an ethical act. The wonderful tools of Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance help us to make those purchases more justly and more sustainably, to positively impact workers and the environment around them. The great thing about Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance is that it's not just about avoiding doing the wrong thing, but it's that we pursue doing the right thing, of building a more just, sustainable, healthy world, of strengthening our communities, and of addressing historic injustices by doing justice in the world today. Please make sure to check out the Catholic Ethical Purchasing Alliance in ways that you and your community can get involved.